In this current market update episode of Beyond Bitcoin, we discuss the weekend's market volatility, why a rise in interest rates of just 0.25% affected the Japanese yen, which impacted global carry trade, aka cheap money, and how that caused a domino effect across equity and crypto markets. And we also discuss our view that the blockchain-based crypto industry is solid and all things being equal is likely to recover in the short term. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Beyond Bitcoin. This episode is brought to you ahead of time where we're recording relating to the market conditions of the day. With me today, of course, is our analyst, Good morning, Greg Dalton. Hello, Greg. And I'm wearing my infamous red jumper to signify the red that we've seen in the market for the last few hours. That's brilliant. I'll go out and buy you a green jumper very shortly. So what's happened in the market in the last few hours has been quite extraordinary because we've seen the CCI 30, the cryptocurrency index top 30, drop nearly 20% month to date. BTC's dropped 19% in the last seven days and is now down to $53,900 at the time of the recording. It's intriguing to see that the correlation between crypto and equities is still very strong. Uh, and so therefore global activities, global events, economic events are impacting crypto in a typically higher volatility manner than equities gets um, impacted. Now, one way of looking at this, of course, is that the fear and greed index uh, last week was sitting at 67, full on greed. And today it's sitting at 17, extreme fear. But put in that perspective, last month it was sitting at 29, fear. So the market's volatile. But let's talk about what's happened to the market, why we've seen this sudden pullback across equities, across crypto, across gold, all sorts of uh, assets have suddenly been pulled back risk on assets. And the reason why is intriguing, but I think what everyone wants to know is for how long. Over to you, Greg. Oh, thanks, Derek. I think the important thing to, to talk about first up is we think this is a temporary shakeout. We think it's going to be fairly short lived, be creating an excellent buying opportunities. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the volatility of crypto. I think that they will potentially recover as rapidly as they fell and actually be probably be healthier for it. I think what we're seeing is a real case of traditional finance mm. or TradFi, global macro causing correlations with crypto to spike along with their volatility as, as the macro dominates the micro. But the crypto ecosystem is sound, very sound, and on a much better footing than perhaps than it was in 2022. Mm -hmm. So as I said, yes, lots of volatility. That's as we talk about volatility is a feature, not a bug for crypto. When everything looks really bad, everything mm -hmm. tends to be correlated together. That's exactly what we've seen. And that, let's dive into some of the some of the reasons behind this uh, fallout that we've seen. Exactly. So on Sunday, Ethereum dropped 20% in a day. In hindsight, that was actually the canary in the coal mine, wasn't it? Yeah, yes, it was. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that. Actually, there's a number of reasons. Let's go into them specifically around Ethereum. As you, um, mm. the SEC approved the Ethereum ETFs um, last month, the flows into them initially were very mm -hmm. solid. But we have seen some outflows, and that's mainly coming from the Grayscale ETEH uh, Trust, uh, which has a much higher management fee than the other ETFs. So you've seen some se some similar selling in that yes. that you've seen within the Grayscale Bitcoin um, ETF. So ETH's been under pressure. So it had that initial spike when the SEC confirmed the ETFs would be approved. And then we've had a bit of a sell-off as once they started trading, as you've seen those outflows. Now... There's also been an issue around one particularly large hedge fund called Jump Trading. They look like they've liquidated about $500 million of their ETH positions. So they have now the speculation as to why that's happened. We don't like commenting on rumors, but we'll tell you what the rumors are. One of the rumors is that they are under investigation from the Commodity Futures Trading Commission for their activities during the lunar market crash and some of the price reactions that we've seen in the last 
uh, 24 hours have been sort of akin to that sort of reaction. But they're, they're under potentially under investigation from that. The other rumour is that they were using free carry trade yen as a source of liquidity to fund a lot of positions. And with yes. the Japanese, the Bank of Japan raising yes. interest rates, uh, they may have been forced to liquidate their position. So a couple of reasons behind why Jump is selling ETH, but that's specifically, uh, that particularly has put a lot of pressure on the second largest cryptocurrency within the ecosystem. And maybe talk a bit more about what appears to be the domino that fell, and that is the Bank of Japan raising the interest rates by 0.25%. But from a base of zero. And exactly what is a carry trade? And what are these base trades? And why do they affect speculative assets like equities and crypto? Yeah, it's, it's, a, very, it's a very simple one, actually. It's cheap money. There's very difficult to find cheap money in the world at the moment. That you look at where US interest rate short-term rates are above 5%. The UK just recently started cutting rates, but they're still, you know, fairly high. The Bank of Japan was the last holdout. It kept rates at 0%, uh, which meant you could borrow money in yen at, and use that yen to go and um, buy other yeah. assets and, and basically gear up your position, which made sense when, you, when your, dollar, your cost to borrow is 0%. It was an easy carry trade, and it was one that a lot of hedge funds were doing. Now, the move from 0 to 0.25 percent doesn't seem like a large move but in reality it is because you're going mm. from paying no interest at all to paying some and that means that some of those investments are no longer viable you've seen a capitulation you've seen a selling of those investments you've seen the japanese stock market had a worse two-day performance than it did on black monday in 1987 down well up into the double digits as people have been selling yen denominated assets but the yen itself has obviously strengthened so there's just been a, a, a massive sort of flow on effect in, into traditional finance markets and that lack of liquidity. And we know that uh, crypto uh, does trade very much on liquidity, uh, available liquidity. A lot of that liquidity has been sucked out of crypto as well. And of course, when the Japanese yen goes up in value and everyone's borrowed in yen and have got to get out of the yen, that's going to cost them money too. So the 0.25% is the cost of the, the interest rate and then the rest of it is the cost of the payback. So this has caused a problem. A lot of liquid assets have been sold over that period. And of course, in crypto, like in equities, you would then be seeing leverage wound out of the marketplace. Is that what we've seen in crypto too? Um, that's a slight understatement. Yeah, we've seen about a billion dollars worth of liquidations in the past 24 hours, actually over a billion. That's, it's been good to see a lot of these protocols like Aave have really done very well. They've worked well under the pressure uh, of these liquidations. We did see mm. Ethereum gas, which is measured in Guai, go into the triple digits and even into the four digit level. So gas got really expensive to do anything on ETH. Obviously, people were panicking a little bit on, on the Ethereum uh, network because of the, the price impact that we were seeing. You've also, obviously, perpetual futures being offered by, by centralized exchanges as well. All of those seem to cope with the liquidations, but it does have a, tend to have a cascading effect. As those liquidations hit the market, they tend to drive the price mm. lower, which then means that more leveraged positions get liquidated and so on, so on. You have a waterfall effect. So I think we've, we've seen the worst of that impact now. When now we've, we've had a little bit of a bounce, a bit of a recovery from sort of the $48,000 level to, to up towards $54,000. let us see how things settle as they will over, over, over the next few coming days. And let's see what the impact is. But also, it's worth, it's worth talking about what's happening in the US and the US economy as well, I think. So from that perspective, as we got... Well, that's right. You, you go there. So we've got labor data that's come through. And of course, we had the Fed just recently turn around and say they were looking favorably towards reducing interest, which many economists around the world have said too little too late. But nonetheless, they are two indicators but we still haven't seen some of the big indicators coming through over the next month. So a lot of these decisions are getting made on the labor rates and potentially fed. Yet there's more to come. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think you're right. I think they've been too they've been too slow to react. They've obviously been focused on the headline and the core inflation numbers, waiting for those to come down. In the meantime, the US economy looks like it's on the brink of recession. In fact, one of the key rules that people tend to follow is indicating that the US is about to tip over into recession. 
and it's going to be another five more weeks before the Fed meets again. So there is a possibility that they have a, an emergency meeting um, mm. to cut rates, uh, but they need to start cutting rates aggressively if they're going to prevent the US economy going into recession. And of course, that's all compounded this year with the presidential election as well. So um, that's not going to be seen uh, favorably by yes. the income. Your last scorecard on the economy is the economy moving into recession. So there's an interesting dynamic there, I think, that's worth talking about as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah, well, so please do. It's interesting that since Joe Biden has decided not to contest the upcoming election and Kamala Harris has received the nomination from the Democrat Party, the probability of President, former President Trump winning the, the election about 70 percent, he was almost unbackable as the potential winner, to around the sort of mid to low 50 percent. So this is putting, putting a slightly different spin on things. As you well know, President Trump at the Bitcoin National, sorry, the Bitcoin Nashville Conference was very positive about Bitcoin, yes. talked about sacking Gary Gensler on day one, talked about potentially using Bitcoin as a strategic reserve hey. asset, a very pro crypto, pro Bitcoin. So he's Trump is best, basically seen as, as being good for crypto, whilst the Democrats, whilst they seem to be warming towards crypto, they have been very negative in the past. And one wonders why, whether they're simply just making yes. noises about being more accepting of crypto to get the, the crypto bro vote, or whether they genuinely, genuinely see it as an opportunity for innovation and growth and for the US to be at the core of that, eco, in that sort of technology going forward. We'll have to wait and see. But certainly that, that uncertainty about a, a less probability of Trump winning is also impacting sentiment in crypto markets as well. And so that, including the uh, war in potential war, or certainly Iran's strike on Israel, seem to be tail indicators to this. The main discussion is around the yen and the carry forward of the yen and the recent labor data to trigger this risk off position. I'm surprised how little the market has interest in the Iran-Israel conflict over the weekend. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's one where the market probably won't price it in until it happens because there's still a lot of uncertainty whether something actually does happen. It's been very well flagged by Iran that they, if, they were doing, if they would do something, they would do something this week. And you've seen a, a build-up of US and yes. UK military assets around the, the region in sort of yes. preparation of that. So... It may be quite a muted response. It may be an all-out effort at the moment. It's a known unknown. We think it's coming, but we don't know how significant it will be, and probably the market will react to it when that happens. And I guess judge the scale of what the conflict may escalate into, whether it becomes a full-blown conflict, God forbid, that we enter into World War Three, or it's something that's simply just a knee-jerk reaction and then things start to cool down again. That's a, a bit of un, the only real uncertainty that we have left in front of us at the moment is how, how this escalates going forward. So I'm not sure whether Michael Saylor is a drinker of French champagne or whether he'd have it for breakfast. But I do wonder at the moment, with the reduction in uh, price of Bitcoin, whether he has knocked the top off a bottle and said, thank you, and is pouring himself some champagne. It must be, must be leaning into risk time for Michael Saylor, leaning into buying more. He's a sort of a dollar cost average guy. And he's, he, whenever Bitcoin sees these pullbacks, he invests and he's proven to do extraordinarily well out of it. So that's our view. Our view too is in this is a, a short term position. We can always be proven wrong because it's impossible to predict complex economic systems. But certainly we continue to have a view that it's a really relatively short term impact. Is that correct? How would you word that, Greg? Yeah, uh, first, Michael Saylor's terrible at timing, actually. <laughs> You're right, he does have a he does a long term DCA on buying Bitcoin, but he's terrible at, at picking prices. Yeah. He, he actually right? bought a lot of his recently. So before before the market pulled back, don't forget Bitcoin's Bitcoin's down about 30% from its March highs. Yes, this would be the ideal time for him to be raising more money to buy. But then it's interesting, you've seen Peter Schiff has come out and said, well, you can't have Bitcoin as a strategic reserve asset because it's too volatile and look his argument makes sense in the current environment you want a strategic strategic asset to protect you when everything is turning to to mud 
and you don't want that asset falling than everything else you're trying to protect, which is what's happening. But look, I think Bitcoin's still going through that maturing process. I think very importantly, Morgan Stanley were the first wirehouse in the US to allow their advisors to make a re recommendation to clients about having Bitcoin in their portfolios going forward. That's the first wirehouse to do that. That is significant. That will trigger the second wave of buying for Bitcoin to come through from from IRA and, and, and accounts from you super basically superannuation accounts in the US. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a very significant move coming. So yes, I think short term it's all very negative, but that tends to be the, the short term reactions. The macro environment looks challenging. We may get a, an emergency meeting from the Fed to cut rates, but it won't be enough in the short term. A little bit more uncertainty ahead, but these these things always create buying opportunities when you take a medium to longer term perspective. That's right. Whether this really is a short term drop and the recovery is fairly prompt or it takes a further period of time, our view on this market is simple. It's three to five year cycles for investors. Our personal view on the market, of course, is probably well reflected in something that someone asked me the other day and he said, how long should I invest in the crypto industry and in the crypto market in, in this sector, this blockchain sector? And I thought about it for a moment and I said, for the rest of your life, because it's not a sector that's going to go away. It's a sector that has price volatility in it. And I noticed that one of the New York Times headlines today is when the stock market drops, stay calm and do nothing. And if you're a trader, of course, that's not the case. But if you're an investor, then I think that's not bad advice along the way. Anyway, any last words, Greg? No, I think, as you said, investing in crypto is like investing in the very, very early stages of the Internet 30 plus years ago. So we're still using the internet today more so than we ever did 30 years ago and despite all the pundits at the time who said that it was a passing yes. fad history doesn't repeat but it's certainly rhyming <laughs> with some of the commentaries that we're seeing about um, crypto being a passing fad and only used for criminals and all of these sort of different rubbish that we see the fact is crypto and the blockchain technology will be endemic across all databases across all financial institutions around the world and will be the main way that assets are secured going forward. Understanding that is important and that really gives you a view on, on why you should own these things, like I said, for the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah, very good. And Greg, also thanks for your market commentary. We're going to release that uh, today along with this Beyond Bitcoin ahead of time. Normally it goes out on Friday, uh, but today we're going to get that out on uh, Tuesday. And, and that market commentary, along with Mark Whitten's market commentary, should be an interesting read for our listening audience. Bye for now. We'll see you next week. See where the fear and greed index is by next Tuesday. And, and let's see how our investors can. Cheers. Thanks, Derek. Bye for now.